Good morning, everyone. All right. One person said good morning. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Good. I want to invite y'all to stand on your feet as we get ready to start our morning worship. I just want to take a moment to just not only say welcome to you all, but thank you all for being here. Uh, let's go to the Lord uh, before we sing together. God, we thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you that you have made many ways when there wasn't a way. And Father, I thank you that one of those ways is that you brought us here together this morning to worship you, to praise you, to give you honor and glory and praise. Lord, we just ask that you have your way this morning, that you move as you see fit. Lord, I just pray that you speak through every element of our service. Father, that we might grow closer to you in knowing who you are and grow more full in the knowledge of you, Father. Lord, I also pray that someone might come to know you through what we do in this room today. You are a good God. There's no one like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this out together. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. Sing how great, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age. And age to age he stands. All time is in his hands. All time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. The Godhead. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son. Father, Spirit, Son. The Lion and the Lamb. The lion and the lamb. Sing how great, how great is our God. Oh, sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. We'll sing it again. How great is our God, is our God. Lift your voice and say, how great is our, and all will see, see how great, how great is our God. Yes, he is. Whoa. Sing his the name. You're the name above all names. You're worthy. You are worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great is our God. One more time, you're the name, you're the name above all names. You are worthy, you are worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great. Our God, yes, He's great. Sing how great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. One more time, sing. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. 
Good morning. Good morning. Oh, one more time. We're in church. It's time to be happy and excited. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. My name is Ellen Hills Ring, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to Life Church Riverside this morning. Today we are in week three of our series in honor of Black History Month called Beauty for Ashes. We are looking at black history through the lens of faith. Last week, Pastor Jalen did a great job with the, with the topic of a new song. And Pastor Jalen, I want you to know that I sang all week long. I turned it up. I got Amazing Grace, Aretha Franklin, and I sang all week long because of you. Yes, so it was wonderful. And you're right. Singing really does change your spirit and get you out of challenging times. So thank you. This week, Reverend George will speak to us about beauty for ashes. Let's listen in for God's word this morning. And then let's take God's word into next week into the workplace, into home, into our places where we gather with friends. Remember, church is just the starting point that guides you through the week. We have exciting news for you. Our Life Kids program is launching the first Sunday in, in March, March 5th, which is the next time we will be here at Marygrove. On Sunday mornings, during their service, our elementary age youth will gather to learn about Jesus, talk about their faith, and of course, have some fun snacks too. Elementary school age children and parents, you are invited. Please join us. If you would like to be a part of Life Kids as a teacher or an encourager to our youth, we'd love to have you too. You don't have to have a seminary degree. Just contact Gail, who was our executive admin, at admin at lifechurchriversidedetroit.org. Again, that's Gail, and her email address is admin at lifechurchriversidedetroit.org. You can find that email address in the chat or in your programs. You and I know that being in church once a week isn't always enough to sustain you. If you need a midweek connection with other people of faith, Life Church Riverside has a number of options to help you grow on your faith journey. Sila at 7 takes place on Mondays at 7 p.m. on our telephone conference line. You'll hear a brief word, about 15 minutes, and prayer. What about starting your day in prayer? I know, I do. We pray Tuesday through Friday at 7 a.m. Just call our conference crime, 313-246-9751. On Tuesdays for men and women, on Thursdays at 7 a.m., the men of the church pray, and they have a separate conference call number, which is 586-207-9156. That's 586-207-9156. If you want to help distribute food to youth and families, we do that on Tuesday mornings. So if you're interested, please put it into the chat or see Reverend Georgia, Pastor Georgia, my sister Georgia. Anyway, um, this Thursday at 6.30 p.m., the Bible study will discuss Jesus and the Disinherited, a book by Reverend Howard Thurman that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. read and reread. It's so relevant, it could have been written last week. This week, the focus will be love. You can find all the links for our weekly gatherings right on our website, lifechurchriversidedetroit.org. We have two special guests with us this morning, James Thomas, who will be sharing a special message for the children, and Alyssa Gordon, who will share a spoken word. Then we will have more praise and worship and then the message. I love all of you. I hope you all have a fantastic week. And at this time, I'd like to invite any children to please come and take a seat in the front row. Have a great week. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is James Thomas, and I will be reading from the uh, NIV translation of the book of Isaiah 61.3. And it reads as follows. And provide to those who grieve in Zion to bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. When Reverend Georgia gave me this, I'm, you want me to say this to kids? You want me to break this down for kids? Well, that seems kind of deep, kind of complicated. But, you know, I talked to her and, and we spoke about it. 
And what it really, really breaks down to is in life, bad things will happen. In life, terrible things will happen. In life, some things can happen to you that you never fathom would ever negatively impact your life. But through the for, for, for the grace and endless love of hev our Heavenly Father, he has bestowed upon us and granted us these things of basically uh, joy, uh, the spirit of praise, and our, um, um, joy. Now, now how, how can I just relate this to children? Well, those are saying, when life gives you lemons make lemonade now what does that mean well sometimes when bad things happen to you don't ask why you pray about it and ask what do I need to do and then by praying to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus you will be basically told what you need to do and then you need to have faith that he's going to see you through, you need to cooperate with the Heavenly Father. Not do things your way, but cooperate. Then you will discover that once you cut open your lemons, no matter what they may be, and then you use the appropriate tools that the Heavenly Father gives you, you can make your lemon juice. Then, once you make your lemon juice, you can decide how sweet you wish to make your lemonade. Now, if you study your problems even closer, you will discover there's more blessing in your lemons than you may think, because you have lemon seeds in there, whereby you can grant, you can grow more lemons. And then you study carefully, the lemon rinds have healing properties themselves. So, when life give you young people lemons. Don't ask why. Pray to the Heavenly Father and ask, what do you need me to do while I have these lemons? Let us bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us in, to, in our life. We know that rough times are coming, but through your word in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, we know that you will give us joy in the spirit of love. Um, as we go forward into those uh, trialing tri tribulations. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say amen. amen. I think that there is beauty in everything, but only if you shift your perspective. Think about it. A five-letter virus that ravaged the nations. Hope fled from us all, so the masses wept in frustration. A loved one taken too soon, so we turn our backs to salvation. Anchored to chaos, and we've lost our foundation. But what if your life wasn't a grave? An endless storm devoid of peace, but instead it was a map. A plan, a divine masterpiece, perspective check. I praise God for the suffering that brought me understanding. I praise God for the humility that accompanied my crash landing. I praise God for the pain that brought me to my knees. I praise God for the healing disguised as disease. Jesus Christ will leave the 99 every single time to rescue just the one and that one soul is mine i thought my sin was too great i thought i'd never be worthy but one thing i was reminded of is that the cross stands before me so trust that there lies purpose to your paralysis because there is beauty in everything when you shift your perspective thank you
give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord if you've got it sing it's your breath it's your breath in our lungs, in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath our love so we pour out our praise to you only and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. We'll sing it one more time. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. I want us to sing this chorus out one more time, but before we do, I want to invite y'all to stand on your feet. And I want us to realize that the only reason why we're able to draw any breath in our bodies is because the Lord first breathed it into our lungs. Everything we have, everything we are, it's all owed to Him. Amen? Amen. So let's sing this out. It's real simple. You can say, it's your breath right here. It's your breath in our lungs. In our so we pour so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, so we pour out, so we pour, so we pour out, it's your breath, it's your breath in our lungs, in our lungs, so we pour it out, so we pour it out, yes we do, it's, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour it out to your lungs.
in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great. this song and it finally clicked <laughs> that literally it's the breath of God in my lungs like if God didn't breathe any breath in me I wouldn't be breathing I mean it just clicked in my mind that it's every time we breathe we're breathing the breath of God that's the only reason why we're still breathing brothers and sisters because God has breathed the breath of life into us his Holy Spirit ruach in the Hebrew that's the only reason mm -mm -mm. and all God's people said amen 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 well welcome welcome it's so nice to have everybody with us today I'm really really glad to have everyone with us and thank you uh, brother James Thomas will never look at lemons in the same way again amen because uh, many of us have had some lemon situations in our lives come on somebody if you've had a lemon situation something was kind of a little more tart and sour than what you thought it was going to be you were thinking like I need a little bit more sweetness uh, if you are like that then you know we uh, understand very much what you said that we need to put our make our lemons into lemonade and part of the reason why I wanted James to come and I'm so grateful that his wife and lovely daughter Courtney are here too welcome welcome is because we're kicking off our life kids life kids is kicking off the next time we gather here at Mary Grove which will be March fifth so bring your kids nieces nephews grandkids neighbors kids come on somebody kids you know that might be interested in having uh, some good message and some good time meeting Jesus and some fun and snacks you know you can't have Sunday school without snacks now come on let's get real um, I also want to thank uh, Alyssa Gordon for coming to us um, with that spoken word that was just awesome and uh, thank you so much. And um, 
I'm, I'm bringing regards from uh, Victoria Roberts because actually uh, Alyssa works for Victoria Roberts and uh, she's not able to be here. Judge is not able to be here today. So uh, we, we look forward to her coming, coming back to, to hear you here live. But um, I thank you for that message, which is called the beauty of the pandemic the beauty of the pandemic. And when I heard that she gave a message to her home church in Texas called Beauty, um, the beauty of the pandemic, I thought, well, God, I'll be talking about beauty for ashes. And it's so perfect because one of the things that we know about this season in our lives together is it has been a season filled with mourning. Just like the pandemic, we mourn the loss of thousands of lives. But we're still mourning. We're mourning a young man beaten to death by police. We're mourning college students shot down in the prime of their college careers. We're mourning a war that is taking place in a country and that war should not be going on. And we're, we're mourning thousands and thousands and thousands of lives in, in uh, Turkey and in Syria that have been taken by this earthquake and we cannot even believe or appreciate the magnitude of entire cities, entire villages, entire families that were struck it, struck and listen to me, that were struck down in the middle of the night. I mean, it's impossible to imagine, but we are mourning, we are mourning the losses, we're mourning all kinds of things, and I don't know about you, but I'm wondering, is there some meaning to my mourning? Is there some purpose to my mourning? Can I get something out of this mourning, God, or must I continue to cry and have my head held down and feel kind of low because of all the death and destruction that is going on? And of course, we must mourn. Because if we don't mourn the loss of life, then what kind of human beings are we? If we don't cry when young people get shot, if we don't cry when families are destroyed by a pandemic, if we don't cry because of an earthquake, then what kind of humans are we anyway? We cry because we love those whom we've lost. We cry because we mourn their passing. We cry because they made an impact on our lives. We cry and we mourn to God because we love them. And we love God for sending them to us. We must mourn. But let's face it, there's got to be more than just mourning. I wonder this morning, though, if maybe our mourning is an invitation to think about mourning in a different way than we normally do, to think about it as more than loss of life. But that there is some mourning that comes because of situations that are going on in our community. That there is mourning that comes because we lament and we grieve what is happening because of uh, racism, because of violence, because of human trafficking, because of uh, police brutality. And maybe God is asking us if we will mourn because of sin in the land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe we are to mourn because of the sin, not only our own personal sin, but the sin of our neighbors and the sin of our friends and the sins of people that we don't even know and don't even like. Can we mourn the sins of the people that are our enemies? Can we mourn the sins of the shooters? Can we mourn the sins of the corrupt politician, the liar, the cheater, the adulterer, the thief? Can we mourn their sins as well? It's quiet in here. It's quiet in here. It's quiet. It's quiet. Well, I believe the passage of scripture we're going to look at today, this passage in Isaiah 63, I believe, uh, 61, excuse me, I believe this passage invites us to consider mourning in a slightly different way, in a broader way. To think about mourning now is mourning what goes on in our communities every day when children and elders are abused, when families are broken, when, when violence takes place. We need to mourn. We need to mourn, my brothers and sisters, but I think that God wants us to look at the mourning because of sin. Look at, look at Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, if you've got your sword, or you can look up on the screen. Y'all know what the sword is, right? What's the sword? 
the word of the Lord. Amen, somebody. All right, somebody's been reading. Praise God. I like that. Okay, Isaiah 61, beginning at verse 1. Now, this particular passage of Scripture was read in the temple. Jesus comes into the temple. He opens up the scroll, and he begins to read. And when he finishes reading this first verse that we're going to see here, he finishes reading it. He closes the scroll, and he sits down, and he says, Today, this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then there was a riot. Because no one could believe that he had the nerve, the absolute unmitigated gall to claim that he was the one spoken of in this passage, that he was the one that had been anointed to come to preach and to heal and to proclaim liberty. But look at what he says here. Isaiah 61, beginning at verse 1. The spirit of the Lord God upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now that's where Jesus stops reading. But let's go on and read what the prophet Isaiah is saying. Because the prophet Isaiah is talking to a community much like ours. Talking to a community that's been damaged, ravaged, destroyed. Talk to a community that's in exile. He's talking to a community that's kind of broken down. He's talking to a community where the leaders have been co-opted and bought out. Come on, somebody. Hmm. It's quiet in here. Amen. Beginning at verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Mm. This is a powerful passage of scripture, my brothers and my sisters, because this passage of scripture that Isaiah has written is the word of the Lord for the people of Judah and Israel that have been destroyed. These people have been, they've lost in battle. These people have um, had their, their leaders and the intelligent, the skillful, the artistic. They have been carried away in exile, and their city is lying in ruins. It has been burned down. Come on, somebody. There's some places that are still burnt down, Alyssa, from the 1967 riots in Detroit. Some places that have still never come back. We had a riot in 1967, and there are still some parts of the city that are still broken down and raggedy. We know what it means to be in a community that's been ravaged, that's been attacked, that's been destroyed because of violence. This is the community that Isaiah was speaking to, and Isaiah was saying, you know what? You all were doing things that you should not have been doing. You were worshiping gods you should not have been worshiping. You had forgotten about the poor. You weren't taking care of the widows. You had disregarded the orphans. You were worshiping every idol that came down. Whatever idol was new, come on somebody, don't we do it? Whatever is new, we're going to worship it. Whatever new teaching, whatever attractive idea is on video or TikTok or Instagram, we're all in. Maybe this will work. Maybe that will work. You know, folk are looking for all kind of remedies in all kind of places. They want to burn stuff, buy stuff, smell stuff, lay down and stuff, look at stuff, watch stuff, eat stuff, and they're going to be healed, set free, and delivered. Come on, that's the truth. Well, all right. and, 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 so, and so Isaiah says to the people, says, listen, listen, what you need to do is come back to the Lord. Just put all your little idols down, put your rabbit's foot and your horoscope, horoscopes, put them down, put all that junk down and come to me. Just come to me. If you will come back to God, Isaiah says, this is what the Lord will do. This is what the Lord will do. The Lord will comfort those who mourn. Mm. Though he will give beauty for ashes. See, 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 in ancient Israel, when people mourned, they put on ashes. They put on ashes and they sat in sackcloth and they had a sad look on their face and they looked depressed because things were not going well. And so they put ashes on. And so the scripture is saying that God will come in and instead of ashes all over your head, I'm going to put something beautiful there. I'm going to give you beauty. I'm going to give you a crown. I'm going to give you a headdress. I'm going to give you a beautiful turban. I'm going to give you something beautiful, like those big Easter hats we wear. Come on, somebody. Those big church hats folk wear. Well, I'm going to put something beautiful on your head instead of those ashes. You're not going to be in a place of mourning. In fact, you're going to be in a place of celebration. That's what will happen if you come back to the Lord. 
It says, it says that he will give beauty for ashes. He'll give the oil of joy for mourning. Listen, when people were mourning, they didn't put oil on their faces. <laughs> now, this is really funny in the African-American community. <laughs> because <laughs> when we were kids, what did, mom, what did mom always tell you? Put that Vaseline on. Put some oil on your face. When you went out to school, come on, that's what you did. You had to put some oil on your face. Come on, somebody. Uh, I shouldn't tell tales out of town, but, you know, some people in certain households put, put, the, put the bacon grease on your elbows. Come on, somebody. They get the bacon grease from the little jar on the back of the stove. Y'all don't know anything about that. And, 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 and they would take the little grease and put it on the elbows and the knees, and we go to school smelling like bacon. But, but we always put some grease on, don't we? Put some, we are some grease-wearing people, amen? So, 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 so we know what it means to, to come out of the house with your face dry and crackling. You look sad. You look sorry. And that's what the people of Israel will do. When they were in mourning, they didn't put grease on their face. They didn't put any oil on their face. There was no cream on their face. They came out dry and dusty and crackling, and they had the ashes on, and they were looking sad and broken down. And God will come up, and he'll give you the oil of joy. He will pour it out. He won't just give you a little bit of joy. He won't just give you a teaspoon or a thimbleful. He won't give you a half cup or just eight ounces he will give you the oil of joy and he will pour and he will pour until your heart gets mended until your hearts get lifted up until your mind gets fixed again that's what Jesus is saying in these words Jesus is saying that if you will come back to me that I will give you the garment of praise I will give you a, a, a wrap you'll be wrapped up in praise instead of that spirit of heaviness that Hebrew word there means like a dimly lit candle come on somebody Sometimes we got people that are so broken down that their lives are like a barely flickering light that's just about to go out. And, and Jesus says, I'm going to come. God says, I'm going to come, and I'm going to give you a garment of praise. I'm going to give you not, not, not good-looking clothes. He, he's not talking about good-looking outfit. He's talking about where you will be clothed in praise, where your life will be praiseworthy, where you will be praising God, where you will get up in the morning and say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, that you will praise him in the noontime, and you will praise him at night. That will be the thing that you will do because God will come into your life fresh and new. God says that there will be consolation and comfort for those who are mourning. And so, and so, and so, you and I are invited, you and I are invited to take our mourning, to take our brokenness, to take our loneliness, our hopelessness, and do something with it. Like Claudette Colvin. Some of you all know Claudette Colvin. 15 years old. Looks like just a lovely, pleasant girl. This girl was a fighter. This girl was a fighter just nine months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, Claudette Colvin refused to give up her seat. See, Claudette Colvin had been studying during what? Black History Month. Claudette Colvin had been in school and they were studying Black History Month activities. They were looking at famous figures from black history. They had been studying about what was going on. And she was living in Montgomery, Alabama. And Montgomery, Alabama had some of the most strict and racist codes of any city. And their bus system was notorious for treating particularly women with violence. The bus drivers had been deputized and basically had the same authority as police. And if they told you to get off and you didn't get off, they would have you arrested. Sometimes they would beat you. bus driver shot somebody who was on the bus who refused to comply with the orders. Does that sound familiar to anyone today? That's how it was in Montgomery, Alabama, and she'd been learning about this. She'd been learning about what was going on, and one day she was on that bus, and when the bus driver told her to get up and give her seat to a white person, she said no. He said, what? He said, are, are, are you going to get up? She said, no, it's my constitutional right, she said. I paid my fare just like this lady paid her fare, and I get to sit exactly where I want to sit. Well, she didn't say it all like that, but she did say it's my constitutional right to sit here. 
And you know what happened next? What happened next was they called the police. And the police came and they put her in a police car. And then they took her down to the courthouse. They took her down to the police, to the police department, actually. And I just want to give you, I want to share with you a few things of what she just said. This is what she said. My head was just too full of black history. You know, the oppression that we went through. It felt like Sojourner Truth was on one side pushing me down and Harriet Tubman was on the other side of me pushing me down. I couldn't get up. That's what she said. She couldn't get up from that seat. She couldn't get up from that seat. You know what she was doing? She was mourning. She was mourning the racism in her community. She was mourning the segregation in her community. She was mourning the violence. But she didn't just mourn um, by doing nothing. Come on, somebody. She did something with her mourning. She did something with it, and she prayed all while she was doing it. When the bus driver said, are you going to get up? She said, I started crying, but I felt even more defiant. I kept saying over and over in my high-pitched voice, it's my constitutional right to sit here as much as that lady. I paid my fare. It's my constitutional right. Fifteen years old, arrested and taken to jail, put into jail. She said that when she heard the jail door clank closed, that there was, that she was really terrified then. This is what she said. She said, I recited the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm over and over in my head, trying to push back the fear. I had no idea how long I would be there. I cried and I put my hands together and I prayed like I had never prayed before. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 15 years old. Of course, her pastor and family members came eventually to get her out of jail. They bailed her out. And she appealed to the NAACP. Her family appealed to the NAACP, and they appealed a couple of times. And they, they, they reviewed her case, but they did not receive her case. A third grade marshal was on the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at that time, and they reviewed her case, but they did not take her case. Uh, they examined her case, but they would not move forward with her case. Her case just sat there. Her case just languished. And then when Rosa Parks showed up with the very same set of circumstances, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund ran with the Rosa Parks case. That case became public news. That case was all over. That case became part of what we now know as the history that led to the initiation of the Montgomery bus boycott. They took Rosa Parks case, but they didn't take little Claudette Colvin case. They said she was a teenager. They said they didn't know if she could really be dependent upon. And then she went and got pregnant. And they said that she wouldn't be a good case. They couldn't use her. They wouldn't want to put her in the public because here she was a young teen, unwed mother. They wouldn't do anything about her case. It looked like her case was dead. It looked like nothing was going to happen. There she was, humiliated, upset, agitated. She had put her career on the line. People were talking about her. She was getting abuse from the people in community because of what she did as a young 15 year old girl it seemed like everything was lost until mm, because you know remember now she prayed she prayed while she was in the police car she prayed while she was in the jail she kept on praying she kept on praying and because she kept on praying I want you to know that God heard her prayers because she participated in the United States Supreme Court case which you know young woman over here a Browder versus Gale come on somebody that eventually come on judge in the back eventually that what desegregated bus transportation in Montgomery she was one of those plaintiffs. You see, God took her ashes. Come on, somebody. God took her disappointment. God took the fact that her case wasn't going to be managed. God took her situation and did something else with it so that she could be part of the victory. You know, the Montgomery bus boycott ended because of Browder versus Gale. Because four plaintiffs, there was five and one dropped out, four plaintiffs pursued their case to the United States Supreme Court. And because that case was victorious, because that case was appealed, but the appeals failed, do you not know that that case, Claudette Colvin, a name many of us have never heard of, she was one of the girls in that case. And because of that case, the Montgomery bus boycott ended 300
278 days after it started victorious because a little 15 year old girl had been studying some black history and knew how to call on the name of the Lord and refused to have her rights violated she wasn't going to take it she decided she would do something and I believe that when we take the morning for communal sin when we take the morning for the violence in our community when we take that morning and we allow our pain to fuel our action then something can get done oh yeah 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 God gives beauty for ashes and guess what else God gives for ashes come on somebody God gives power God gives purpose because mm -hmm. the end of this passage says that, that we would be oaks of righteousness that we would stand tall that we would stand strong I know there are some of you that have some ashes in your life. I know there are some of you who feel like you've got some situations where stuff got all burnt up. But I'm here to tell you that there is life after ashes. There is life after devastation. There is life after disappointment. And if we will be like Claudette Colvin, come on somebody, if we will put our hands together and put our head down and pray like we've never prayed before, God will do something in your situation. So what is it that you and I are invited to do? What is it that you and I are invited to do? I believe there are three invitations for us today. And the first one, the first one is, whatever the first one is. <laughs> the first one is, is to see the injustice. That's the first one, to see the injustice. Now, what does this mean, to see the injustice? One of the reasons why people cannot see the injustice is because they have no idea what the justice of God is all about. When we become acquainted with the fact that God demands, God insists, as a matter of fact, God says, what? I love justice. The same passage, 61, same, same passage that we're reading right now. It says that I love justice. When God says I love justice, that means that he hates what? Injustice. And people need to be able to discern the difference between justice and injustice. It's not impossible to discern, my brothers and sisters, and much of what you hear on the media. Please disregard it because much of what you hear, people taking this, this grandstand and holding up Bibles, it's not the Lord. Well, well. It's quiet. See the injustice. Come on, let's go to that scripture. If you look at Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58 will help us understand what injustice really is. Look, look at what this says. And not what injustice is, but what we are to do about injustice. Look at what it says. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Fasting from, from, from sweets and meats. And people are fasting from all kinds of stuff. And God says, um, I'm not impressed with that fast. Any, anybody can fast from sweets and meats. Come on. But, but what y'all need to fast from is loosing the bonds of wickedness. That's what y'all need to be fasting. You need to be fasting from wickedness. You need to be fasting from oppression. You need to be fasting from putting yokes on people. You need to be fasting from economic insecurity. You need to be fasting from violating and destroying the world. Come on. You need to fast from those things. That's what you need to fast from. You need to fast from all that lying and cheating and stealing. Come on. That not only that we do, but we celebrate it. Come on. We celebrate those kinds of things. And that's what's wrong with our world today is that we celebrate stuff. We know, so many of us have lost the courage to be able to say, you know what, this is wrong. A little bit of applause. So, 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 so first of all, see the injustice, see the injustice. Number two, go to God, go to God, go to God, go to God. That's what Claudette Colvin did when she was in a tight, what did she do? She prayed, she talked to God, she went to God. That is one of the most important things you and I can do with whatever it is we're doing. Whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter if you're on, if you're marching, if you're pursuing some acts of justice, of peace, whatever you're doing, if you're lamenting the sin that is in the land, you've decided you're not gonna take it anymore, you're going to get involved, great. But 
make sure your effort is God ordained. Make sure it's God ordered. Make sure that you've got God on your side. Make sure that you're on God's side. Amen. Don't just try to get out there by yourself. Don't just do it because the people around you are doing it. Come on, somebody. Do it because you hear the call of the Lord calling you. And do it because you know that God is inviting you into this thing. You'll know if you seek God's direction. Look at what it says about how we can come boldly to the throne. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. And when we come boldly to the throne of grace, we will always find help in the time of need. Let us therefore come boldly. Do you know you can go boldly to your father's lap? You can go boldly, saints. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what that word grace really means? Their grace means their supernatural power. It means forgiveness and mercy. It means that when you're weak, God is strong. It means that when you're tired, God is fresh. It means that when you're lonely, God will bring you comfort. It means that when you don't have resources, God will give you resources. It means when the doors are locked, God will open a door that no one can close. You see, that's what it means to find grace, to find supernatural favor, to find grace when in the time of need. So when it is that you and I feel that we can't take it anymore, when feel like like we got to do something. We've got to stand up. We've got to speak out. We've got to object when we are tired of mourning and we are ready to fight. This is what we need to do. We need to go boldly to the throne of grace. And then finally, we need to pray with our legs. Pray with your legs. Pray with your legs. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, um, when we're on the prayer line, women's prayer line, there's a woman who always says at the end of every prayer session, she says, now when you all finish praying, get up from your knees and go out. And, and, and this is where, I, maybe this is where she got it from, pray with your legs. Anybody know who said this? All right, come on, brother Jalen, come on, Jalen, all right now. Can we pull up that Frederick Douglass quote? This is what Frederick Douglass said. Now, Frederick Douglass was a beast, right? He was just awesome. Look at what he says. I prayed for freedom for 20 years but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. Mm -mm -mm. So, 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 that, so that prayer must be combined with what action? Prayer must be combined with action. When it came time for Frederick Douglass to leave and Frederick Douglass and his um, new wife hatched a plan and Frederick Douglass got some papers that belonged to another seaman, his um, wife-to-be got himself a, a suit of clothing in some nice blue with the gold buttons and he dressed up like a seaman. And there were many black seamen in the day of Frederick Douglass. They were very skilled and knowing the waterway. See, not all black people are afraid of water. Come on, somebody. There were very skilled seamen. And in fact, in the Navy, there were more black people in the Navy than any of the other branches of the military. And there were many black trained seamen. So they were accustomed to seeing seamen. And so when he went and he traveled dressed up as a seaman, he was able to take a train out of uh, Maryland. He was able to take a train and he was able to go to uh, Pennsylvania, I think it was. And he was way up. He was on seaways and waterways and he finally made it out. And when he came out of that thing, it was because uh, he had he, he believed that he had to do what? He had to take action with his prayers. He had to put action behind it. He had to step up to the plate. He had to decide that I'm not going to take it anymore. He turned his pain into the fuel that drove him to do what he did. He was abandoned at the age of six at a plantation. He had no mother. He had no father. He had no grandmother. His grandmother left him. He was six years old and he lived his life getting beaten again and again and again. And again, when people asked him what school did he go to, he said, my diploma is on my back. He had an encounter with somebody called the slave breaker. And the slave breaker's job was to break him down, to beat him and break him down. And Frederick Douglass writes, I was beaten down. He broke my soul. He broke my spirit. But the next day, Frederick Douglass said, I don't know what came over me. I don't know what spirit came over me. But I got up and I grabbed that man's throat and they fought for two hours and that was the last time that slave breaker tried to break Frederick Douglass. I want you to know today that God will give you beauty for your ashes. God will give you power for your weakness. God will give you hope for your despair. He will pour out the oil of joy for your mourning. He will give you a garment of praise for your heaviness. 
listen, listen, listen. There is a flower in South Africa called a fire lily. And it only grows after a fire. It's beautiful, isn't it? The red leaves, it grows in ashes. And you know what's interesting? It's not the fire that makes it grow. The scientists have figured out it's the smoke. You know, in the tabernacle, you know what the smoke represented? The incense represented the prayers of folk. The prayers of folk. This is like a, this is like a, 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 a flower that grows in the prayer after a fire. It grows in the prayer after the ashes. It grows in the prayer after the destruction. It grows in the prayer that comes when we lift up our voices and we decide that we're not going to take it anymore. I'm looking at a room full of South African fire lilies and you are growing you are striving you are thriving even in the sweet to trust in Jesus I don't know all the words the songs like some of you guys do but it's sweet to trust in Jesus right it's so sweet to trust in Jesus because Jesus will show you the way out of no way so as anyone that does not know Jesus today or if you're looking for a place to grow in your faith to develop your 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 ministry gifts, develop your, your faith and to work together in a new vision, a new church. I invite you to come now. And if you need Jesus Christ, just come forward at this time. I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. say to anybody out in our live stream audience if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ please communicate on the chat with somebody in one of the chat rooms and they will make sure that we get your information and we will connect with you because we invite you to give your life to Jesus and I say this every week but it's really true it's the best decision you will ever make amen it's the best decision you'll ever make. So we have a little bit more worship that's coming forth at this time, and it is the worship of giving. And I'm going to ask Deborah Gasson to come forward and uh, just to invite people to give. Good morning, saints. Did you hear from the Lord this morning? Do you understand the power of prayer and God-inspired action after prayer? I said, do you understand the power of prayer and God-inspired action after prayer? If not, listen to this again. Go home, get it up on YouTube, get it up on Facebook, and listen again. Amen? Now, the action that is asked of us now is the action of giving. So, Father, we just are asking now in the name of Jesus that you would move upon the hearts of your people to bless this ministry 
with their financial resources. Father God, we, we understand that we don't have anything that you haven't given us. From the breath in our lungs, to the clothes on our backs, to the houses in which we live, and everything else, every morsel of food, every, trans, every way of transportation, you have given it all to us. So now, Lord, we would like to give something back to you in gratitude. So I pray, Father, now in the name of Jesus, that folk would give as they can give with joy. Not only is the oil of joy uh, for mourning, it is for the joy of giving. There should be joy in giving. So let us give not under obligation, but because God has been good to us and we want to express our gratitude. Father, we thank you now in the name of Jesus for the gifts that your people will give. We thank you that you first gave it to us. Now we return a portion in thanksgiving and gratitude for what you've done for us. We also, Lord, just commend people. Uh, there are ways to give. Not only can you give by check in this service, but you can also give to uh, by way of uh, Cash App. It's uh, hashtag LCR uh, Life Church Riverside. And then we have a P.O. box, which right this minute, uh, I do not remember the name, but I, 21274, post office box 21274, Detroit 48221. Uh, you can also mail your check. And then you can also go on our website and click the give button. You can give that way. So Father God, we just thank you now for every gift we have received, every gift we are receiving today, and every gift that we will receive in the future. We, we will put it to the use of the furtherance of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, saints. The word of God has been preached. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? Amen. Amen. You know, in listening to the pastor's message this morning and thinking about Sister Colvin, it occurred to me that at 15 years of age, she understood who she was in Jesus Christ. And that we as God's people need to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord. And God has put the enemy under our feet. Satan is a defeated foe. And if we would only realize that as God's children, we would understand that we can change the world around us. Amen? Amen? You know, many of us in our families experience the suffering that comes with intergenerational sin that has never been broken. That somebody somewhere in the past did something and it was passed down from one generation to another and it continues to plague us to this day. But I tell you, saints, starting in our own homes, we have the power to break the enemy's influence over our lives. And so as Sister Colvin prayed, if we will pray for our children, pray for our spouses, pray for our brothers and sisters, pray for our aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, God can turn their lives around and we can begin the process of rebuilding our homes and our community. So I invite each and every one of you to understand who you are in Christ. And as Sister Colvin did, pray and ask God to give you the strength to do what God wants you to do. And he will answer your prayers because it delights God to see us loving one another and expressing the care of Jesus for one another. So what I'd like to do for our benediction today, I'd like us all to stand. And in honor of those who preceded us, who demonstrated the courage of Christ through the civil rights struggle, let us sing the great him of the struggle, we shall overcome. We shall, shall overcome. We shall
Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and in the world to come. Amen. Yeah.